my name is Eric. Today I'm going to be talking about this book here. It's called The Logic of Scientific Discovery by Karl Popper, and it is considered to be one of the most important books of 20th century philosophy of science. And you'll see why, because a lot of what he talks about, and what I'm going to discuss from his work, we now just think of as the way science is done. But of course, these ideas originally, someone had to come up with them and be able to distinguish between what was good science and not so good science. So I'll get right in. One, one of the things he did is to consider, to contrast his views from prevailing views about what good science is. So there was a class of philosophers known as the positivists, and they had this idea that not just science, but anything that was meaningful could only be things that were verifiable. And so their criterion of what was meaningful and what was just nonsense are statements that are verifiable. And even in more general, you could say that there was this idea that the purpose of science was to get to certain truth. Of course, there's a problem with that, which Popper points out, and he's not the first to point out the problem of induction. So inductive reasoning is when you have some set of experiences and you try to generalize and make a general statement from those experiences. And so the classic example showing the problem is that perhaps you've seen some number of swans and thus far every single one of them has been white. You might be led to conclude and to state all swans are white, but of course black swans exist. And so this statement is not true. So inductive reasoning does not get us to certain truth. And so certain truth is not the end goal of science. And verifiability, meaning the ability to show something definitively to be true or false, cannot be what distinguishes meaningful discussion or science from nonsense. And so Karl Popper proposes what we now accept as the the appropriate approach, which is that what determines the value of a theory, a scientific theory, is its falsifiability. Because even though you can never definitively prove something, you can definitively falsify something. So there are some statements which one accepted observation refutes. And so with this, we can actually make progress because we can actually start throwing things out and getting closer to truth even if it's not possible to ever actually reach it. So this is the most important distinction he makes between other schools of thought, which we now generally accept, which is falsifiability is a criterion which distinguishes scientific endeavors, empirical science as he calls it, from others. And so he, the other class of discussions he classes as metaphysics. Now, we often talk about metaphysics in scientific communities as entirely negative as, as if it is just superstition. Uh, interestingly, at least in this work, which was 1935, earlier in his career, uh, he doesn't speak negatively about metaphysics. So he actually criticizes, in criticizing the positivists, he has a bit of a joke and he says that they are trying to kill metaphysics by calling it names. And the names they call it are, are nonsense or non-meaningful or, or those sorts of things. So he sees metaphysical ideas as not belonging to science, but not necessarily being entirely negative. Now, there are metaphysical ideas that can hinder progress, and so we're aware of many of these things. We learn about religious dogmatic ideas that prevented science from moving ahead during the Renaissance and the early days of the scientific revolution, and yet there are metaphysical ideas that can actually push us forward. An example he gives is speculative atomism. So, Going back to the ancient Greeks, there were some schools of thought that thought all matter is made up of indivisible elements and the variety of matter that we see and things going on around us come from novel combinations of those fundamental elements. And of course, now we have something that we call atomic theory, but at that time, you couldn't have called it a scientific theory by the definition that Popper is giving. It was metaphysical, it was a non-falsifiable claim, and yet that could have led us eventually to get to the theories we have today. Another example might be the metaphysical faith, unprovable, but that there are regularities to nature. This is a faith that most of us instinctively have, that nature has an order to it, it has laws that can be discovered. Now, he goes on to talk about this in more detail, 
But suffice it to say that such a belief, although not purely scientific, can affect how science is done. And so it's not necessarily all negative. Okay, so in criticizing induction, another thing he points out is that there are those who say that the approach of science is to sort of gather information, we are gathering observations, and from that we sort of infer generalizations that become our theories. So that, that is the direction in which science moves. But he points out that there's a problem with this, which is that if you were told right now today, start writing down all of your experiences, your observations right now, what are you going to write down? There are an infinite array of details that you could write down about your experience. Like in this corner of the room, I'm seeing this particular shade of blue, or I'm feeling this sensation in my left arm. And if that's pain, perhaps that's a heart attack, you should get that checked out. But the point is that with if you're just saying, I'm going to observe things and then generalize, there is no framework to narrow that infinite set of possible perceptions to something finite and manageable. So theory is something, is a framework which allows us to determine what is worth looking at. So we have a theory about how things work and that allows us to make specific predictions. So this is his, his framework, that we start with theory, we have some grand hypotheses about the way nature works, we combine that with specific accepted observations about nature and combine those together to use deductive reasoning, not inductive reasoning, to come up with predictions. And those predictions can then be tested and we can see if this prediction turns out not to agree with what we observe in nature then it calls into question the original theory or part of the theory that we propose and contrarily if it agrees so the prediction comes out to be true this doesn't prove as we've said it doesn't prove and verify that the theory is true it's simply that we have not yet proved it false and so theories that have been tested severely and been thus far corroborated do become useful and a sort of usefulness uh, these value judgments do underpin Popper's view so he, he doesn't make any apology about this in some sense we're looking to find what is the best way to do science based on what leads to actual progress and what counts as progress and what counts as good he, he leaves sort of fuzzy and so it is still based on some some human judgment of value now you might ask okay but where do these theories come from and now he points out that this really is outside of his scope of investigation because where ideas come from is an interesting question but it doesn't really matter so long as we have an idea we can then use our deductive reasoning in combination with specific observations to make these predictions and the process continues and if we falsify some hypothesis very thoroughly and we need to start from the drawing board we might come up with some other idea again so there's a room for imagination in this and he actually quotes einstein who says there is no logical path leading to these laws meaning whatever laws they can only be reached by intuition based on something like an intellectual love of the objects of experience. And so it, it does leave a very human element, which is interesting. And this sort of suffuses his whole work, this sort of optimism and sort of positive look at, at what science is and, and that it's not just this, this dry exercise. Now, one other question that he addresses is how do we choose between theories because at any given time in any given field we might have multiple theories to choose from and so if we're saying that we can never prove any of them to be absolutely true how are we choosing between them so this is where he gives the idea of degrees of falsifiability so certain theories are more or less falsifiable well what makes something more falsifiable well if you have one theory that is a subset of another theory so we would say that this theory is more general then that is a better theory or a preferable theory and the reason is because it is actually more easy to falsify because the number of things it prohibits in reality and by prohibits i mean the number of possible events that would be contradictory to the theory uh, 
is greater. And so this is a, a considered a preferable theory. And he, he describes how this is actually the direction science tends to move, that we propose some theory, some part of it or all of it gets torn down. But obviously, if it had been an accepted theory for some time, there must have been some corroboration. So then the next stage is to create a theory that encompasses the original theory and explains why we are getting some positive results and also explains the new falsifying results that caused us to question the previous theory. So universality is, 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 the, is one of the determining factors of what is more or less falsifiable and therefore more or less preferable. So as you can see, a lot of what he's proposing is a set of conventions. He's not describing science as having an absolute foundation. In fact, at one point he describes it with a metaphor that essentially what we're doing is trying to find a foundation. We are drilling into a bog and putting down piles that we can build something on top of. So again, this is based on some pragmatic human idea of value that we can do something with this. But how deep we need to drill the piles is a matter of, of judgment and convention. So we just need to drill far enough that we can create a structure on top of it. But we're not actually ever hitting rock bottom. Right? We're not reaching some absolute truth. So I think that's the, the basic idea. I there He goes into a lot of other things regarding uh, probability theory, where it gets very dense. Uh, and I didn't get a lot out of that myself. So I haven't spoken about that. Uh, but he does warn against this tendency where we might say one hypothesis is more probable than another, where we really don't have grounds to say that. Really, we should focus on which is more or less falsifiable. So he reiterates that. But overall, what I enjoyed about this book is, is sort of the optimistic view that he has while still being realistic. And it, it does make science seem like an exciting endeavor. So I'll read a couple more quotes that are in sort of how he wraps up the book. So one of them is here, he says, although it can attain neither truth nor probability, speaking of the scientific endeavor, the striving for knowledge and the search for truth are still the strongest motives of scientific discovery. And he also quotes another philosopher named Whale saying, once and for all, I wish to rec record my unbounded admiration for the work of the experimenter in his struggle to wrest interpretable facts from an unyielding nature who know so well how to meet our theories with a decisive no, or an inaudible yes. And lastly, speaking about certainty, he refers to certainty as an idol. And he says, the worship of this idol hampers not only the boldness of our questions, but also the rigor and the integrity of our tests. The wrong view of science betrays itself in the craving to be right, for it is not his possession of knowledge of irrefutable truth that makes the man of science, but his persistent and recklessly critical quest for truth. So to make it more cliche, it's not the destination that matters, but the journey. So I will leave it at that. That is my review of uh, Karl Popper's Logic of Scientific Discovery. And an interesting follow-up question that perhaps I'll address in another video is, where does engineering fit into this? So my own background is engineering. So if you're a researcher in engineering, you may not have exactly quite the same goals as a pure scientist. So how might we describe our own field? That would be a question perhaps to think about. Thanks for watching.